Let's look at an actual case that illustrates the importance of these points. The patient is a gravid one pair of zero at 41 and a half weeks in early labor. Since admission, the patient's fetal heart rate tracing has been uncomplicated with moderate variability. But at 2108, a bradycardia begins, and immediately the fetal heart rate drops to a nadir of 60 beats per minute. The patient is turned on her side, and additional conservative measures are employed. Two minutes later, the fetal heart rate rises to a rate of 100 beats per minute with a brief period of marked variability presumed to be the result of this acute hypoxic event. Within 90 seconds, however, the fetal heart rate once again drops to 60 beats per minute. Conservative measures are continued. Seven minutes after the bradycardia begins, the patient is taken to the OR. The patient arrives in the OR at 2118, 10 minutes after the onset of the fetal bradycardia. The OR crew is immediately present. The fetal heart rate is now 70 beats per minute, with occasional increases to 90 beats per minute, lasting for 10 to 15 seconds. At 2121, two and a half minutes after arriving in the OR, the fetal heart rate rises to 150 beats per minute. Everyone begins to relax, but before they can make it to the door, the fetal heart rate precipitously drops to 70 beats per minute once again. Transient elevations of the fetal heart rate during a bradycardic event are not uncommon and are attributed to activity by the fetal adrenal glands, one of the three organs preferentially spared during asphyxia. It appears under situations of extreme oxygen deprivation that the fetal adrenals will release catecholamines in the systemic circulation, which can result in an increase in fetal heart rate. These brief periods of increased fetal heart rate that occur in the context of fetal bradycardia should be viewed cautiously. If the underlying condition that precipitated the bradycardia in the first place has not been ameliorated, the increase in fetal heart rate will be short-lived, as in this case. At 2124, the patient is intubated and immediately put to sleep. 16 minutes after the bradycardia begins, the skin incision is made. At 2130, delivery is accomplished, 22 minutes after the onset of the fetal bradycardia. A 44-10 gram male with APGARs of 1 and 6 is delivered by STAT C-section with a cord umbilical artery gas of 6.92, 64, 24, and minus 22 and a cord umbilical venous gas of 7.22, 54, 56, and minus 7. The normal cord umbilical venous gas signifying adequacy of maternal and placental oxygenation and the significantly acidotic cord umbilical artery gas evidence of an inadequacy of fetal oxygenation are highly suggestive of an umbilical cord prolapse. Of particular interest in this case is the cord umbilical artery base deficit of minus 22. The base deficit, a derived number that measures the degree of lactic acid in systemic circulation, was equal to, in this case, the total time of the bradycardia, 22 minutes. Studies have shown that in cases of extreme reductions in oxygen delivery to the fetus, as is presumed to occur in most fetal bradycardia with a fetal heart rate of less than or equal to 60 beats per minute, the base deficit can increase rapidly and a significant acidosis may result. Providers should therefore treat transient elevations of the fetal heart rate during bradycardic events with extreme skepticism and continue preparations for emergent delivery should the elevation in fetal heart rate be brief.